على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا مولانا محمد عليه وعلى آله أفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم We are in the 10 days of the Hijjah, the best days of the year, the best nights of the year in Ramadan and these are the best days of the year. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to reap the best by investing the best in these 10 best days of the year. My brothers and my sisters, our Dhul Hijjah series focuses on the story of Ibrahim traveling through the Quran as told in the Quran. And today we're going to continue from where we left off last uh, time and we're going to be beginning with Surah Al-An'am, Ayat 74 all the way to 83, 84, Ta'ala. Ten ayat but contain so much wisdom and so much profundity, Bidnillah Ta'ala. We begin with a recitation. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال إبراهيم لأبيه آزر أتتخذ أصناما آلهة إني أراك وقومك في ضلال مبين وكذلك نري إبراهيم ملكوت السماوات والأرض وليكون من الموقنين فلما جن عليه الليل رأى كوكبا قال هذا ربي فلما أفل قال لا أحب الآفلين فلما رأى القمر بازغا قال هذا ربي فلما أفل قال لئن لم يهدني ربي لأكونن لئن لم يهدني ربي لأكونن من القوم الضالين فلما رأى الشمس بازغة قال هذا ربي هذا أكبر فلما أفلت قال يا قوم إني بريء إني بريء مما تشركون إني وجهت وجهي للذي فطر السماوات والأرض حنيفا وما أنا من المشركين وحاجه قومه قال أتحاجوني في الله وقد هدان وقد هدان ولا أخاف ما تشركون به إلا أن يشاء ربي شيئا وسع ربي كل شيء علما أفلا تتذكرون وكيف أخاف ما أشركتم ولا تخافون ولا تخافون أنكم أشركتم بالله ما لم ينزل ما لم ينزل به عليكم سلطانا فأي الفريقين أحق بالأمن إن كنتم تعلمون الذين آمنوا ولم يلبسوا إيمانهم بظلم أولئك لهم الأمن وهم مهتدون وتلك حجتنا آتيناها إبراهيم على قومه نرفع درجات من نشاء إن ربك حكيم عليم ووهبنا له إسحاق ويعقوب كلا هدينا ونوحا هدينا من قبل ومن ذريته داود داود وسليمان وأيوب ويوسف ويوسف وموسى وهارون 
وكذلك نجزي المحسنين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين These ayat discuss the beautiful journey of Ibrahim alayhi salam going through a journey of self-discovery according to some of the commentators and a journey, a journey of modeling according to others. Some of the commentators say that when Ibrahim is asking these questions, he's actually looking for truth himself. It's in the beginning of his journey and he's looking to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know that the idols that my parents worship and my uncles worship, I know this rock and stone, it doesn't have any power intrinsic to it. I know there's something greater than this. I know that the one that, I'm, that I want to believe in, the heart that I have is longing towards believing in something greater than myself, greater than this rock. But where is he? Who is he? What is he? These are the questions that Ibrahim is going through. Others say no. Actually, Ibrahim, because he's a prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that conviction from an early on. But by asking these questions, he's modeling to other people around him. Is it the sun? Is it the moon? Is it the star? Could he, could that be Allah? Of course not, because they perish. That's the essence of the message. So on one side, we have people that believe from the commentators that Ibrahim is looking for himself, and others say he's modeling the kind of questions that the one who's looking should be asking to find and to discover Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in terms of the legacy of Ibrahim, it's important to situate these ayat within the story and within the context of Surah Al-An'am. Surah Al-An'am comes to deal with one of the major issues that people who are in doubt have. They think that a physical miracle happening in front of them would lead them to believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you look at the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear. وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّنَ عَلَيْهِ مَلَكِ وَقَالُوا لَوْ, لو, لا أن, لو لا أُنزِنَ عَلَيْهِ مَلَكِ So the people are saying, if only Allah were to send an angel, or if only Allah were to send a clear book, وَلَوْ نَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ كِتَابًا فِي قِرْطَاسٍ If only the, Allah were to send a big book that we'd be able to touch with our own hand, then we can believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear, and He says, if we send the biggest signs, eventually they would say, it's just a magic, it's just magic. Is just an illusion. So even the biggest miracles, people eventually would reinterpret them to suit their own desires and to suit their own preconceived notions. Think about Fir'aun. Fir'aun saw Musa split the sea. Did he believe? No. Because power blinded him. The wealth that he had blinded him. Banu Israel, they saw Musa perform all of those miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to perform. Imagine the nine miracles that Allah mentions in Surah Al-A'raf and other places. Did they believe? No, because the inferiority complex blinded them. They were still recovering from the years of oppression by Fir'aun. So they were in a point where they couldn't, they couldn't fathom the idea of having my own self-identity to be able to make and create my own destiny? No. So they wanted to copy others. That's why when they came across a group of people that were worshipping a calf made out of gold, they said, hey, we're, we're worshipping a, a, a cow of some kind or worshipping a deity of some kind. It looked very elaborate and beautiful. They said, hey, can we get one like that? So they're still stuck in the mimic. Mimic what the other has. And we suffer from this as an ummah. You know, having come from the colonial era, the post-colonial era that we're living in now, we're still suffering from that inferiority complex. Or we're always looking at the other and saying, maybe that's, that's what we should have. The other ideology, the other belief system. So in this passage in Surah Al-An'am, there's a very beautiful reminder and that is, physical miracles happening around you are not going to change you. Because even if you were to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see Jannah and see Jahannam and then come back for a second chance, you would open your eyes first couple of days, you'd be excited, do great things, and after a while you start thinking to yourself, shaitan would also catalyze that thought process. What if it was all just an illusion? What if it was a dream or a nightmare? I don't know that it really happened. The chances of it being you know, re realistic are much lower than the chances of it being an illusion. Because by default, a miracle is that which defies the norm. So that which defies the norm has a higher chance of it being explained through other normal things as, a, as an illusion, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a you know, some, some form of deception than it actually being real. So fine, okay, we, we're not going to get any miracles. The Quraysh would respond to this original message and original suggestion. But then can we at least get something? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them through this. Here's an example of someone, Ibrahim, who had the height of Iman, and how did he discover Allah? 
He discovered Allah by looking around him. So let's begin. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ لِأَبِيهِ أَهْزَرَ أَتَتَّخِذُ أَصْنَامًا آلِهَةً Ibrahim speaks to his father, Azar. Some say that it's his guardian, his uncle, guardian of some kind. But at the end of the day, the ayat are clear that it is his father. And that is the strongest of opinion. But some others have suggested that it could have been his uncle. But this is a secondary discussion. We're not going to get into the details. Just to focus on the point of the story, which is Ibrahim speaks to his father, Azar, or his guardian, Azar. And he says, are you taking at a takhidu asnam and aliha? Are you really going to take these idols, these little rocks and stones, as your Lord, as your deity, things that cannot benefit nor harm you, things that cannot see. يا أبتي لما تعبد ما لا يسمع ولا يبصر ولا يغني عنك شيئا. My father. Now look at this. Look at the balance between standing up to authority, standing up for what is right and just, and at the same time being respectful and kind in the way that you do it. Respecting authority while challenging it. That's what Ibrahim does to his father. His father used to, according to the narrations, and his family was involved in the construction of the idols and the business and the selling of the idols. So they knew that this stuff meant nothing to, 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 to them. But they at the same time knew that it meant a lot to people. So they were willing to sell people false lies to feel better about themselves and in the process make money themselves, subhanAllah. So here Ibrahim is questioning his dad. Dad, ya abati, my dear father, look at that respect. Why do you worship as a community? Why do we worship? Why are you encouraging people to worship? That which does not hear. And that which cannot see. And that which has no autonomy to benefit you. That which has no capacity to make a decision to benefit you. Or provide for you in any way. And here the ayah is also complementing the ayah in Surah Maryam. Ya abati. Or لأبيه أتتخذ أصناما آلهة إني أراك وقومك في ضلال مبين. I see, based on my perspective, look at the beauty of the words. I see you and the people that you lead to be in this clear, manifest misguidance. This is clearly an error. This shouldn't be the way you worship Allah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala then says وكذلك for standing up for what is right, for standing up for what is just. For challenging the authority in what he knew to be true in the most respectful of ways. In that way, we give Ibrahim the capacity to see the kingdom of the earth and the heavens around him. So, by standing up for justice a little bit based on what he knew, Allah opened up his eyes to see much, much more. And here's the first lesson when you implement that which, which you know, even if it's little, Allah will open up your eyes to know more and to discover more and to study more and to see more. As if your eyes by themselves, they can only see very, very little. But when the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enhances through your submission to Him and your humility, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can allow you to see much, much more than what others can. So you will not be deceived by appearances and deception. You will be able to see the true reality of the things that you're looking at. And the hadith is very clear. I, I, you know, the hadith uh, Al-Qudsi about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you draw closer to him through the things that he's made obligatory upon you until he loves you. And when he loves you, he becomes the eyes through which, we, through which you see. The hands through which you're striking and dealing with the world. The legs through which you're able to implement and walk and work in this world. And this is a reminder, subhanAllah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change your makeup to see more, to do more, to understand more. Allah nurus samawati wal ard. That Allah is the light through which the heavens and the earth come to exist. And the beautiful ayah in Surah An-Nur talks to us and tells us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's capacity to enlighten us, to allow us to see. So Allah says here, and because of this, we, we will allow Ibrahim to see the subtleties in the heavens and the earth. And he will get to a point where he's convicted. He will get to a point in conviction, in belief, where he knows 100% through not just a logical, you know, hypothetical, deductive, you know, set of like X leads to Y, leads to Z. No, no, no. It's going to be a lived experience because he will see the signs of Allah around him. So the lesson here, when I commit to Allah based on what I know, when I search, when I discover, when I stand up for truth, and when I see wrong, I stand up for, I resist it, at least internally in my heart, Allah will allow me to see. So I have to take the first step. And when I take the first step, Allah will give me that ability to, 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 to see in an enhanced way. Then what happens? 
I attain conviction. When I commit to that path of searching and looking, using the guidance that he's given me. 76, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When he was covered by the night, alone, looking, if you, if you take the opinion that he's searching, or in front of others, if he's demonstrating. When he's now covered by the night, the stars are fully bright out in the open. He looks at one of them. He sees a star, a kawkaba. And what does he say? Hada Rabbi. Hey, maybe this is my Lord. Perhaps this is my Lord. But when the star disappeared, its, it's light was now overshadowed by other stars. Or it, you know, it, it became you know, distant in everything else. He said, you know what? No. If there's more of you, I can't like that which perishes. I can't like that. I can't attach my heart to that which is just one amongst many. Yes, it's a radiant star, but look, there's another radiant star. So it blurs out. It's one, but it's not the only one. So the first thing he's learning here is my Lord, the one I believe in, has to be one unique, but he has to be the only one. So look at how he's coming to conclusions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by observing the world around him. He's not just the one, but he's the one and only one. Al-Wahidu Al-Ahad. So la uhibbu al I don't like that which perishes. I don't like that which disappears in the distant, in the back. Then, Then his eyes gaze towards the moon. Perhaps this is my Lord. Hada Rabbi. But then the moon set out of the distance. You could no longer see it. Right? Now that you, you know, the earth is rotating, the moon is no longer in sight. What does he say? When the moon disappears from his sight, he's no longer able to see the moon. He says, If my Lord does not guide me, I will surely be among those who are gone astray. Which means that I've come to realize that on my own, I cannot attain guidance. That if I rely on my own vehicles through which I know, I will always realize that my knowledge is limited. If I depend on my ability to see, that is limited. My ability to hear, that is limited. My ability to think, that is limited. Even as a society, let's say I have my own limitations in my thought, but as a, huma as a humankind, as a, as, a, as a species, we might be able to fill in each other's thinkings and fill in each other's gap, but even our collective human memory and collective human experience is limited. So he's coming to realize, Ya Allah, on my own as an individual and on our own as human beings, we'll always be limited. So I need you to help me find you. I need you to help me look for you. I need you to help me understand you. Look at the submission, the height of submission. And how does he come to that conclusion? Because his, his fitrah, his primordial instinct, his natural primordial state is intact. His intuitive innate state is intact. Allah has placed in us the, the precursors to wanting to find him and the tools through which we're able to know him within us and outside of us. We will show them the signs around them and within them. So what does he say after that? Then when the sun comes out, when the sun is now clearly visible, he's able to see it. He's maybe this is my Lord, whether he's demonstrating or whether he's searching. This is my Lord. This is much bigger. The moon was a small little thing, but this is much bigger in radiance. You know, back then they didn't know that the moon is reflecting the light sun. So he's just, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just giving us, don't, don't get into the subtleties and the complexities, just based on what you see. You see the moon, gone. It cannot be the Lord because the Lord would not be something that disappears. You see the sun, but the sun is gone. My Lord, even though that, Lord, that sun is bigger than the moon, it's still not what I believe in. Why? Because the sun set, and when it set, he says, Inni mimma tushrikun. I'm absolving myself of anything, believing in anything or any being that you believe in. So he's now deviated. He's going to become Hanif. He's Hanafa means to deviate. So he's going to deviate from the norm. He's going to challenge the norm. He's going to challenge what everyone believes in about these limited beings being gods. 
limited human beings being gods, limited rocks and stones being gods, limited celestial objects being God. And what is he going to say? He's going to say beautifully, Inni I have certainly wajahtu wajhi. I'm directing my face to my heart. Now my qibla. Now imagine he's 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 looking at his body. He's like, I'm going to orient myself. Where am I going to Where am I going to orient? Where am I going to look? Where am I going to going to search for Allah? Where am I going to put my faith and my hope and my trust in? He says, Inni wajahtu wajhi. I'm directing my face to the one and I'm putting my faith in the one who created this whole universe. Who created the heavens and the earth, the moon and the stars and the sun. There's one that has to be creating all of that and he cannot be created. So he's saying, I'm going to direct myself to the uncreated being who created everything. The one that everyone needs but needs no one. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And I will not associate with him, the one who created everything, anyone else. So I'm going to put my faith purely with ikhlas and invest it in him and him alone. وَحَاجَّهُ قَوْمُهُ And his own people, as soon as he started believing in this stuff, are they going to leave him alone? No. So they came and they debated and they negotiated. قَالَ أَتُحَاجُّونِّي فِي اللَّهِ وَقَدْ هَدَانِ So he says to them, really? You're going to debate me about Allah, my Lord, when he has guided me? So they're coming to him and they're debating. But what are they debating about? They're debating about someone that he has a relationship with. Someone that now he's in a lived experience with. So when he went down that path and did what we mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him a conviction now where he can enter into those conversations, enter into those debates, and his heart is fully certain, fully convicted, at ease, in tranquility, knowing that what he has is true. So they're now debating him. And what happens when, subhanAllah, you know, some things are not mentioned in the Quran, but you can deduce them. Because after the debate, what does he say to them? And I'm not scared of the things that you attribute power to. I'm not scared of them. Why do you think he's saying I'm not scared of them? Because they're intimidating him. They're saying, if you don't believe, if you don't go back to what we believe in, if you don't come back to what's socially acceptable, if you don't come, come back to the norm, guess what the gods are going to do to you? Guess what we're going to do to you? You're challenging our socioeconomic status. You're challenging the status quo. You're doing, you're disrupting our economy. You're disrupting this. You think we're going to leave you alone? You think the deities are going to leave you alone? So what is his response? وَلَا أخاف. I could not care less. I'm not scared. I'm not scared of what you believe in along you believe with Allah, the things you associate with Allah, the things you gave false power to. إِلَّا أَن يَشَاءَ رَبِّي شَيْئًا And then he follows it by saying, I'm not scared except if Allah wills for me to be scared. Look at the height of submission. I am not scared now, but I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow. Allah is the one who's ultimately in control. So if Allah wills for me to manifest signs of panic and fear and intimidation, that's His will. And I'm accepting whatever He wills for me. Look at the height of submission. The height of submission that Ibrahim has. I'm not scared now, and I would like to never be scared, but I know I might do something which might cause Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take that conviction and strength and power away from me. Maybe as a test for you, as a test for me, it can happen. But I can tell you that based on what I know now, I'm not scared. And by saying, إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah, Except for if Allah wills, He's putting His faith in Allah. He's not attributing the strength to Himself. He's not saying, I am, you know, I'm so strong. I'm much better than you. I'm much more, you know, capable. I have, you know, I'm a, I'm a brave man. He's not attributing the power to Himself. He's saying, Allah has given me the tenacity and the resilience and the guidance to be able to stand in front of you and not to be moved by the arguments that you have to the point now where you have to resort to intimidation. But guess what? Intimidation does not get to me because I have Allah and He's given me the power. But if He chooses to take that away from me, that's His will and I submit to it and I accept it. Ya Allah, the height of confidence, the height of submission, balanced together into one. That's what makes Ibrahim an ummah, an a nation, an entire nation by himself. Then what does he say? Illa an yasha'a rabbi shay'a, except if Allah, my Lord, wills, wasi'a rabbi kulla shay'in ilma. Because my Lord has encompassed everything in knowledge. 
My knowledge is limited, his knowledge is infinite. So how can I compare the limited to the infinite? I don't know what tomorrow will bring. I don't know what tomorrow has to offer. And that's what Rasulullah is told to say. I can't guarantee you that I have the treasures and the keys to the treasures of Allah. I can't guarantee you money. I can't tell you what the unseen has to hold. I can't tell you what the future will bring. Okay, fine, you're not going to give us money. What if you tell us where to invest, where to buy, you know, maybe things to allow us to really secure our future. If we know what to expect, we'll be ready for it. I can't guarantee you that. So imagine Rasulullah Rasulullah Sallallahu is telling his own community who's now thinking, okay, I want to believe, but give me some incentive. I can't guarantee you power. I can't guarantee you money. I can't guarantee you what I call you in the And I can't guarantee you that I have supernatural powers that will help you in any way, shape, or form. In I simply follow that which is revealed to me, which Allah has given me. The height of submission. That's what it means to be Muslim. We don't come to Islam for anything else but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَفَلَا تَتَذَكَّرُونَ Ibrahim says, Do you not reflect? وَكَيْفَ أَخَافُ And how do you want me to be scared? وَكَيْفَ أَخَافُ مَا أَشْرَكْتُمْ How do you want me to be scared of the things that you worship which you yourselves have created? How do you want me to respect and to fear and to revere the things that you've created when in reality, you don't have respect for the one that has created you and has given you no power to give this creation of yours any power. Beautiful. So which of the two parties, you or me, is more entitled to safety and security and calm and tranquility in kuntum ta'lamun if you seriously think you know what you're doing and you know what you're talking about if you're seriously holding on to principles and you're willing to have an honest conversation with yourself that is based on sound knowledge and sound logic and sound mantra so how do you want me to be scared of things that you created and things that you attribute power to when in reality I'm telling you that I'm longing to be with the one who controls everything that you know and everything that you don't know, whose knowledge encompasses everything that you'll ever know and the many, many things that you'll never know. SubhanAllah, the height of submission, the height of isna, the height of belief, the height of, the height of trust, the height of sacrifice. What does he then say? Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comments here, an interjection, a lesson, a reminder based on the ayat that we've heard. Who deserves that security? Who deserves that love and that tranquility in heart? Even if the whole world is crashing and things are going wrong, who's going to have that tenacity and resilience to know it's just a phase? There's a reason why this is happening. There's wisdom in this. There's hope in tomorrow. Imagine if you pause in the story, in the middle of the story of Musa, when he's thrown into the river, and the river is going to take him to Pharaoh's house. Imagine when the soldiers pick up Musa and you pause there. If you don't have belief in Allah, what would you think? That's it for Musa, he's done. Imagine if you pause the story of Yusuf when he's thrown into the well, or when he's sold into slavery in Egypt. Pause the story there. What do you think is going to happen? Wouldn't you question Allah in that moment, if that was you going through that difficulty? Imagine if you stop the story of Musa, uh, the story of Rasulullah when he's thrown or when, when people throw rocks onto him because of his belief in Ta'if. And he paused that there with his legs bleeding, he can't walk, his, you know, he's, he's putting his head or he's putting his back to the, to the tree and he's panting and he's like, Ya Rabb, and he raises his hand, pause the story there. What would you do in that situation? So it's not that the believer is not going to th go through difficulty, quite the opposite. The believer will be prepared for difficulty and will be going through difficulties in life to be elevated and refined because Allah picks his hearts and he elevates his hearts meaning for the hearts of the believers so when you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're saying Allah I'm ready Allah will test you to see if you genuinely mean it so it's not that you're not going to be tested you will be tested but it's a matter of Allah will place in your heart that calm and tranquility to accept whatever comes and to deal with it with power to have that confidence, amn, security. Who's deserving of the amn? 
أي الفريقين فأي الفريقين أحق بالأمن إن كنتم تعلمون الذين آمنوا those who believe but not just believe ولم يلبسوا إيمانهم بظلم and they don't mix their belief with injustice meaning shirk إن الشرك لظلم عظيم so they don't like I believe yeah I believe in Allah but I also believe in something else I give power to Allah but I give power to something else so you believe Allah is one, but not the only one. You put Allah on that pedestal, but you also have things around you in your life that are also on the same pedestal. Could be money, could be your wife, could be your husband, could be your car, could be your love for dunya, could be your love for your children. Your love for your children prevents you from doing the things that Allah told you to do. In that case, there you go. So those who believe, but don't mix with their belief any form of injustice. How is shirk injustice? Shirk is injustice because when you give anything power that only deserves or only is deserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're taking the right of Allah and giving it to someone else, that's injustice. That's a crime. So it's, imagine the Quran is getting us to redefine what crime is, what injustice is. Because you ask, imagine you walk into a, an audience and you ask a bunch of kids, give me an example of a crime. Give me an example of injustice. Oh, hurting your friend is unjust. unjust. Taking your friend's toy is unjust. Lying is unjust. Cheating is unjust. What about attributing to Allah that which is not His? You know, in the list of injustices and crimes, that will probably be down there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us in the Quran, إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ That is perhaps the greatest injustice. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ Right? إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ That Allah can forgive almost anything except for you to elevate someone or something to that level where he's at. And knowing the injustice of that kind can happen in many ways. Vivid, like clear shirk, and also subtle, like a shirk al-khafi. Like to show off, to dedicate your actions to not Allah, but to something else. You're standing and praying, but you're doing it so that your status in the community, you is just a social status. The more I pray, I attend Friday, I'll be known as that trustworthy guy. So I'm a mechanic, but if I'm in the prayer constantly, I'm now showing my commitment to the social values. I'm showing that I'm disciplined. I'm showing that I'm honest. I'm showing that I'm increasing my prayer. I'm showing that righteousness and devotion, which has now just become a social capital for me. So imagine faith becomes social capital. That's injustice. So those are the ones who are truly deserving of that safety are those who believe, but they're not believing for any other reason except their love for Allah. وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنُ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ They are the ones that deserve. Allah will give them and shower them with that calm and safety and peace. وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ And it's they who will be guided. So you're looking for that guidance. You're standing in front of Allah 17 times a day and you're begging and you're saying, Ya Allah, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide me, Allah, along the straight path. I'm on the straight path, but guide me along. You're asking for that guidance, Allah is telling you. Mean it. Orient yourself to Him and Him alone. Seek no one but Him and His guidance quickly. Be honest with yourself. Hold yourself accountable. Look for no injustice. Don't mix your iman with anything else. Allah will give it to you. You can't find it on your own. It's a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give. And your sins and your desires and your envy and your jealousy and the things that you're aware of and sometimes the things you're not even aware of, they will get in the way of you knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Imam al-Shafi'i, he says, شَكَوْتُ إِلَىٰ وَكِيعٍ سُوَحِفْظِي I complained to my teacher Waqi about my inability to memorize. I used to look at the Quran and I used to be able to memorize quickly. I used to, you know, some people say they used to cover the left page because he wouldn't want to memorize it before the right page to keep the order of the Mus'haf. That's how quick he was able to memorize. And Allah gives and blesses and He gives and takes in many areas of our lives. He gave him the ability to memorize, which is an incredible talent and a gift to have, especially when you're in this, subhanAllah, journey of standing up for truth, being able to recall and, and, and be able to use the evidence, the book, the text, not just the Qur'an, but other things they was able to memorize. So he used to have that great memory, but what happened to him? So I complained to my teacher about now losing my ability to memorize, losing my focus, losing my clarity. So what does he say? فَأَرْشَدَنِي أَوْ فَأَخْبَرَنِي بِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورٌ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُهْدَى So he informed me, he reminded me and instructed me he told me that knowledge is light. The knowledge of Allah is a light. And the light of Allah cannot be given to the one who sins and disobeys. Remember the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَإِنَّ الْمَرْءَ لَيُحْرَمُ مِنْ رِزْقٍ 
بالذنب يصيبه أو من الرزق بالذنب يصيبه and the human being will be prevented from the risk from the blessing that Allah has written for him or her through the sin that he or she commits Ya Allah so imagine the sin that I commit can prevent me from the good that is written for me whether in dunya material or whether within me guidance, clarity, peace, tranquility, calm, relaxation does that mean I'm not going to go through psychological trouble and not go through anxiety or depression if I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on my side? No, because even the prophets experience sorrow, sadness, and grief. It's normal. But it means that I will not be consumed by it. That I will have the tranquility within me to know and to deal with it. The dua of Musa, Rabbi shrah li sadri. Oh Allah, make my chest expansive. He didn't say, Ya Allah, remove the stress away from me. Take away the burden. He said, Ya Allah, make me stronger. So I can hold more and weigh more on my shoulders. Give me strength. So that's what's going to happen to you. That's what Allah promises. Allah promises that you will have the optimism to stand up and the dua that, that He's going to in, in, inspire you to make the dua for Him to elevate you and to raise you and to strengthen you and to empower you so that you can bear. They are the ones that will be guided. The story doesn't end there. Allah says, وَتِلْكَ حُجَّتُنَا آتَيْنَاهَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِ And then Allah gave the hujjah, the clear evidence to Ibrahim to stand firm in front of his people. So when he showed that conviction and dedication and commitment and looked for that guidance and clarity, Allah gave him the evidence. So you're looking in your life, you're saying, Allah, give me evidence, I want the evidence. Everyone, for everyone is different. You know, for someone it's a logical conversation. Allah exists because of one, two, three, four, logically. And that's it, they believe. For someone else it's an emotional one. For someone else it's a social one. For someone else it's a social cycle, a psychosocial one. For every one of us it's different. The evidence that you will need to believe in Allah will differ. For someone it's a relationship. For someone, we know this. Look at the stories of people embracing Islam. Why did you embrace my Islam, my sister? I saw a woman pray when everyone else was in the middle of a meeting. She executed herself and she went and she prayed. And when I looked at that, I, I thought to myself, either she's crazy or what she believes in is incredibly powerful. And I got to know her, realized she's not crazy. So I began to read the Quran and began to look at her beliefs and I realized they're incredible. So for someone who could be that, that's the trigger. For someone else, it could be a logical conversation. Reading the Quran, wow, this makes sense to me. I know people who believed, believed in Islam and believed in Allah because of one simple ayah, because of one simple equation in Surah Al-Najm. Do you think they were created by nothing or were they themselves the creators of everything? So meaning, are you, are you a created entity and is everything else around you a created entity? Because the one who created everything cannot be created. He needs to be uncreated. That equation itself in one ayah was the reason for people to accept Islam. So everyone is going to come to Islam on a different way, in a different path. And the path to Jannah are many within Islam. But what's incredible here is Allah says, we gave Ibrahim the evidence to be convincing in front of his people. The evidence in personality. Because you can have the greatest argument, but if your personality doesn't, doesn't you know, coll co uh, co uh, collaborate or doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, parallel or doesn't you know co coincide with what you're saying then you lose credibility so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him convincing through everything everything that they wanted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to Ibrahim as what as a gift so the evidence Allah can give you when when you demonstrate your readiness for it but if you're not showing commitment you're saying okay I want Allah to show me a sign if Allah shows me uh, yeah, guide me Allah if you're there guide me that's not a way to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's not, a, that's not a way to speak to the one, who, who are you trying to talk to? You're trying to talk to what's possibly the creator of everything. How are you going to speak to that being? With respect and humility. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we gave him the evidence. And in this way we elevate in status anyone whom we will. Allah will elevate based on his criteria. Not based on our criteria. Because when I look at people, I may be deceived by what I see. I may be deceived by what is apparent. But Allah sees beyond the facades and sees what's really there. So when He chooses to elevate, it's not just based on, you know, you know, hyping yourself up and presenting yourself in a certain way. Allah doesn't read just people's body language and people's expressions. Allah reads intentions. So when Allah elevates, He elevates 
in the best of ways. When he chooses, he may look at that person like Banu Israel did. Why did Allah choose him as a king? He's not the richest of us. He's not the strongest of us. Why him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's response was, I know what is there. And then they got to know him. And then they realized, wow, subhanAllah. Little did we know. Same thing when the angels ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why? why are you creating a being that's going to cause corruption and injustice and this? You don't know what the power that I have bestowed within that being, the human being. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that which we don't know. He elevates and chooses and he takes. He bestows and he humbles and he humiliates and destroys based on his criteria, not based on our criteria. Inna rabbaka hakimun alim. For indeed your Lord, your provider, your caregiver, your shelterer, your Creator, your Rabb, huwa hakimun. He is, he is the most wise, the most purposeful, the most knowledgeable, alim, encompassing in knowledge. Not only did Allah give him the clarity and the guidance and the calm and the safety and the stability and the convincing arguments, then Allah says, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ Then we gave him Isaac. We gave him Isaac and Jacob. كُلًّا هَدَيْنَا all of them we guided. وَنُوحًا هَدَيْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِ Just like we guided Nuh before him. وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَتِهِ And from his progeny, David, Dawood, وَسُلَيْمَانَ and Solomon, وَأَيُّوبَ وَيُوسُفَ وَمُوسَ وَهَارُونَ Aaron, Moses, Joseph, and Yab or Job. وَكَذَلِكَ نَجِزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And in this way we reward those who demonstrate Ihsan. Those who demonstrate the best. So imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that clarity and guidance, and bestowed him with a gift of a progeny that will carry that legacy on. Children that will elevate that message and share it with many, many more people. Imagine how many followers did Ibrahim have around him? Not many. But he caused the revolution to the point where his da'wah, his du'a, Eventually leads to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam calling out in a peninsula. Eventually leads to you and me in the 21st century now. Listening and saying and praying and saying La ilaha illallah. Saying in the salah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. To the point, imagine generations later we're making dua for Ibrahim as a part of our worship. Every daily prayer, that is his legacy. But how many people were there around him? Not many. When he made the adhan in the hajj, in the Kaaba, how many people were there? Not many. And then he, he looked around and was like, and Allah told him, just do it. People will come from every corner. Min kulli fajjin amiq. From every corner of the earth they will come. How long did that take? Years, years, centuries. So don't ever underestimate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. And know that he will will based on a time and a choice of his choosing. And when he wills for your legacy to continue and to stay, nothing can change that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all beautiful legacies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to implement some of the beautiful characteristics that we learn here in looking for truth and looking for guidance based on Ibrahim's story. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that conviction and give us that iman and give us that guidance. Ya Rabb, ameen, ameen. As you know, my brothers and my sisters, we are in the 10 days of the hijjah the best of 10 days. And many of us are not able to pray in the masjid still, masajid spaces are limited and it's still a worry. And many of us wish for the opportunity to give something. Many of us, you know, I was scheduled to be in hajj. I can't be in hajj this year. SubhanAllah. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy. We could have been, SubhanAllah, now, you know, in, in, in the most beautiful of places, going from Mina to Arafah to Muzdalifa, we could have been around the Kaaba. Imagine when I close my eyes and I think to myself, could I have, could I have imagined a year ago I was there, subhanAllah, and I was thinking, Ya Allah, give me, like, allow me to come back this year. And then I received, subhanAllah, the message that I will be, inshallah, giving, giving the opportunity to go back. I was like, alhamdulillah, secured. And then, boom, out of nowhere, everything changed. So now, for those of us who are missing on the opportunity to be in hajj, for those of us who are realizing how quick things are to change, there's an opportunity to invest in the community. Invest in people. Invest in people that are serving. Invest in the youth, in the masjid. SubhanAllah, no, you know, now when you come to Isna, you know, some of you haven't been here for, in, a, in a while, but when you come to Isna and you walk up in the classrooms, you know, there are SubhanAllah videographers working, there are producers working, mashallah, tabarakallah, there are educators working and planning, there are counselors. 
all kinds of counseling. There's a camp going on. There's university. There's a finance class happening in the other room. Uh, yesterday we had, um, you know, the Arba'in Nawawiyah, the 40 Nawawis, and before that we had a beautiful discussion on coaching and energy management and time management. Things we've been dreaming about for a long time are finally here. And in order to sustain them and to grow together, it cannot be done without you and me and us as a community. And we need that resource investment, that financial investment. And here's your opportunity to give back. If I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us all to be generous and to lead by example and to give. And to remember the beautiful ayah, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not attain piety and closeness to Allah and Jannah until you spend out of what you love. And Allah says in Surah Al-Fajr, وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالِ وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا And you have this amazing affinity and love towards wealth. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to give from what He's given us and to spend out of the things that are most beloved to us and to be selfless in these beautiful days of Dhul Hijjah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept. The, donate, the donation button is there. You can contribute as much as you're able to. You know yourself best. بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَذِيرًا and as we're fasting on this Thursday, tomorrow is Friday, so technically the eve of the Eid of Friday is coming up now. And the best of time to make dua for the person who's fasting is as they're breaking their fast and before they're breaking their fast, at the time of Maghrib, before, before Maghrib, after Asr. Like, SubhanAllah, best of days, best of times. Friday is coming up, Thursday night while fasting. Best time to make dua for many of you who are fasting. So we can raise our hands now to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these beautiful days, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by all of his beautiful names and beautiful attributes, Ya Allah, to bless everyone who's working here and everyone who's investing in the community. And I ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant everyone sincerity and knowledge, the benefits and wisdom. I ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us knowledge, comfort, happiness, guidance, clarity, light, and to allow us to be from those who give from the best that you've given them, Ya Rabb, Ameen. I ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help all of those who are oppressed around the world and to make us from those who stand up for justice against any kind of injustice against anyone that is that is receiving that injustice, Ya Rabb Ameen. I ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to stand up against injustice of any kind, Ya Rabb Ameen. And I ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us from those who believe fully, wholeheartedly in you and from those who stand up fully for everything that you've told us to stand up for. And I ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be truly believing, to truly be from those who are humble, to be from those who are truly Muslim, and to be from the people of Ihsan and everything they do and say, Ya Rabb, Ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our parents, to bless our shuyukh, to bless our imams, to bless our volunteers, to bless our workers here who are working here, our staff, Ya Rabb, Ameen, to grant them sincerity, to grant us unity, to grant us rahmah and mawadda, Ya Rabb, Ameen, and to allow us to be from those who live on La ilaha illallah and die upon La ilaha illallah and are resurrected with those who say La ilaha illallah محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رسول الله سبحانك اللهم بحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك نتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته